Good morning. Welcome back to Zion. Thanks for coming out to worship this morning. Uh, Blessed Palm Sunday. First things first, if you are a kiddo and you would like to be a part of our Palm Sunday processional, you should go to the back right now. Pastor Brandon is right back there. He's waving. If you can go to him, we got palms for you. We're going to walk around and uh, yeah, it's going to be great. You get to process between the pastors. So head that way right now as I'm talking. I'll do a couple more announcements while we, uh, we kind of get, get ready and get palms passed out and that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, just if, if you go back, stay back there for just a second. While we sing the opening song, we'll, uh, we're going to come in and, and process and stuff like that. So uh, if you are sitting here still in the pews, um, if you would, at some point during the service, fill out a, uh, an attendance card. So you've got the white one for members, the yellow one for guests in the pew in front of you. And if you pass that to the center when we get to the offering and the children's message part, we will collect those. Um, yeah, we're going to walk around and we'll get your kids back to you in just a minute. Uh, if you would, please rise as we sing our opening song. Can you hear? 
of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. Let us pray. Help us, Lord our God, so that it may be, it may be with joy we begin our contemplation of all the mighty things you have done to give us eternal life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for our reading. Our Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 15, which is the account of the Passion of our Lord. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. The chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. So that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to relieve, release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with the reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the king of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. 
And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up to him, came up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Gave yourself 
As you're able, please rise. Today is the beginning of Holy Week. During it, we shall recall how our Savior gave his life so that our sins may all be forgiven and heaven open to us. Even during worship, our minds wander to other concerns. These concerns are already known to God. Give them into his loving hands for resolution. But turn your hearts and minds to focus on our Lord's step-by-step determination to free us from every sin. Confident of the forgiveness he won through his glorious death and resurrection, let us then admit our sinful condition to him and to one another. I confess to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in my thinking, speaking, and acting. I am mired in sin and incapable of saving myself. Heavenly Father, for Jesus' sake and because of his sacrifice for us fallen creatures, we beg you to forgive, strengthen, and turn us to your will so that we may follow our Savior in loving service to you and one another. As a called and ordained servant of Christ who gave himself over to death that we would have eternal life. And by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his great humility and patience and be made partakers of his resurrection. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. Our Old Testament reading is from Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from Philippians chapter 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. 
I believe in one God, Father Almighty.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a long gospel reading, isn't it? Did you see it? You can look back in your bulletin. All the other readings, the, the two other readings fit on about a third, two-thirds of the page. The gospel reading starts on the first page, goes all the way through the second page, and even spills over onto the third page. It's a long gospel reading. And believe it or not, this is the cut-down version of the gospel reading. If you do the whole thing, you also do chapter 14 of the gospel of Mark. Two chapters in one Sunday. And you do that because uh, chapter 14 of the Gospel of Mark, it has all the Monday Thursday stuff. You know, it has the, the betrayal of Jesus, it has the Last Supper, it has the arrest, it has the trial. And it's kind of weird, I've always thought, on Palm Sunday, that in our Gospel reading, the triumphal entry isn't in there. It's back in Mark chapter 11, by the way. I guess maybe next year we'll read all four chapters of the Gospel of Mark. Come back next year. We're not going to do that. I'm kidding. But here's why we do what we do. Here's why we read chapter 15 of the Gospel of Mark and why we do that instead of a Palm Sunday reading. We do it because conceivably, if we didn't do that, if we did uh, just the Palm Sunday triumphal entry stuff on, on Sunday, every Palm Sunday, you could come to church your entire life every single Sunday and never, ever hear the crucifixion story read. Ever. Ever. You could hear it on Monday, Thursday, of course, or at least the stuff leading up to it. And if you come back on Good Friday, you can hear more about the crucifixion story there too. But if we don't read the Passion Week stuff on Palm Sunday, it never gets read on a Sunday morning in church. And it's an important thing, obviously. Everything comes down to the crucifixion. Everything in our faith centers on what happens to Jesus in our Holy Week. And our theme for this Holy Week is going to be two very simple words that direct our attention to what Jesus has done. And the two very but simple but very powerful words are for you. Everything Jesus did, all the sacrifice, all of the suffering, all of it is for you. Those two very simple words, they are the, the heart of the gospel. They're the heart of why we're here, that all of this stuff is done for you. And my prayer for you this Holy Week is that you will encounter Jesus, that you will encounter him in his word. And encountering Jesus sounds like a really great thing, especially when we're talking about it here in church on a Sunday morning. It sounds great to encounter Jesus, but the truth is that when people encounter Jesus— they actually react in a lot of different ways. They find a lot of different stuff in Jesus. And so I want to look at, in our gospel reading today, three different encounters with Jesus that people have, or pe three different people or groups that encounter Jesus. And so right off the bat in our reading, if you look at the very beginning, we have uh, a description of, of this group of people, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. And, and that's who we start off with. They bind Jesus, they lead Jesus to Pilate, and if you read chapter 14 also, you know that they are the very people who chapter 14 says were seeking to kill Jesus. See, remember, on the first Palm Sunday, Jesus rides into Jerusalem and the shouts are, Hosanna, save us, please. They're asking Jesus. When he rides into Jerusalem, they say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. As he's coming into Jerusalem, they say that the kingdom of their father David is coming to Jerusalem. Those are threatening things. And he spends three days preaching afterward around Jerusalem, teaching. And, and, and in so doing, he calls out these very people, the religious leaders of the day, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the people who are trying to kill him. They were worried. In chapter 14, they were worried not only about Jesus, but also that if they tried to get rid of him, that the crowds would turn on him. But here in chapter 15, they've got the crowd on their side, and they've got Jesus right where they want him. He's bound, he's seemingly helpless, and he's on the road to the cross, on the road to crucifixion. And see, the problem for the religious leaders is that they see Jesus as a threat. When they encounter Jesus, 
They find that Jesus threatens their positions. He threatens their way of life. He threatens everything they've built, everything they've known for their entire lives. As Christians, when we encounter Jesus, we think of encountering a Savior, and we should because that's what we encounter. But Jesus also threatens stuff about our lives. I mean, we live in a world that is twisted with sin, and even though we are made new in our baptism, we are new people because of our baptism, you still got a sinful nature. We all do, and the sinful nature will not let go of us, not in this life, and so our hearts are just not what they should be. They are twisted, they are corrupted, they are not right, and so the, 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 the ways of the world and the habits of our hearts they get threatened by a God who drowns sinful natures and who raises to life new people. An encounter with Jesus is a death sentence for sinful nature. And sinful nature brings with it all kinds of stuff that we cling pretty dearly to. An encounter with Jesus is a death sentence for that stuff, too. Encountering Jesus threatens how we live our lives. It threatens how we use our money. It th- tra- threatens how we spend our time. It, it threatens what we put before our eyes and what we put in our minds. It threatens how we treat the people around us, especially how we treat the people that we are responsible for or have authority over. When you read the crucifixion story, these things are all the stuff that Jesus brings to the cross with him. They're all things that he had to carry there. And they're things that as a result of the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Spirit works out of our lives, through the word, and through the sacraments. Encounters with Jesus are threatening, and sometimes threatening to things that we hold very dearly to, that we can't quite let go. But encounters with Jesus can also create problems for us. That's what happened with Pilate. He's another encounter from our reading. Uh, Pilate is in a very uncomfortable position, really, because of Jesus in our reading. So on the one hand, he's he's got a Roman emperor, and he's got to appease a Roman emperor. And on the other hand, he's got this crowd, this angry crowd who's calling for the blood of this innocent man, this guy that Pilate says, what has he done wrong? Pilate can find no fault in him. So the question for us, I think, or one of the questions as we look at Pilate is, why not just kill him? I mean, he's a, Pilate's a Roman authority. Pilate, Pilate has the power to crucify. Why not just get rid of Jesus, get rid of the problem? And I think part of the answer to that question doesn't come in the Gospel of Mark, but comes in the Gospel of Matthew, 27, 19. Pilate's wife talks to him, and she says, have nothing to do with this innocent man. Do nothing to him. Don't kill Jesus, because she says, God sent me a dream. This guy's innocent. Don't have anything to do with him. So Pilate's in a very uncomfortable position. He's got his wife telling him to do nothing to Jesus. He's got a Roman emperor that he has to appease. And he's got an angry crowd that's calling for this guy's blood. He's stuck. He's stuck between all of those things. And I can only imagine that as Pilate is standing there, he really probably wished that Jesus would have just sort of stayed quietly in his place and not rocked the boat. Jesus causes problems. For Pilate, problems that complicate everything else in his life. So Jesus threatens our sinful nature, but he also sometimes causes problems with us as Christians because we're people of faith, but we also live in the world. And we got bosses, we got teachers, we got coaches, we've got responsibilities. And sometimes those things come into conflict with who we are called to be. Sometimes they happen on Sunday morning, sometimes they call us to do things that we're not sure about. Sometimes these other responsibilities and these other relationships mean that our faith tugs at our conscience. Maybe a friend or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or an acquaintance or a boss or somebody that you are in a relationship with asks you to do something that you know you're, you shouldn't. Or maybe it's even a little different than that. Maybe it's not something you know you, should, you shouldn't, but it's right on the edge of what's right. Or maybe what's right doesn't seem very practical. A lot of the time. Maybe what's right just seems dated and old-fashioned and out of touch. It's pretty easy for us, as we live in a world of pressures and relationships and responsibilities, as Christians, it's pretty easy for us to kind of wish that Jesus would just quietly say, stay in his place on Sunday morning and not rock the boat in the rest of our lives. But here's the thing, 
If the crucifixion story teaches us anything about Jesus, it's that righteousness is not optional for him. Righteousness is not optional for our God. He goes to the cross so that we could be righteous. He dies so that we could be righteous. He is crucified so that you and I could be called innocent before God. And when we encounter Jesus, when we read about his suffering and his death, I mean, it presents problems for us, especially as we live in a world full of stuff and full of people that don't put him first. And there's one more encounter in the Gospel of Mark, uh, one more encounter that I want to take a look at, and it's the centurion. The centurion that's found at the foot of the cross. I, I, I don't know if crucifixion duty was like high on the list. Was that a post that you asked for as a centurion? I don't know, but I can't imagine that it was very pleasant. It was messy. It was painful. It was loud. And it meant standing for hours and hours out in the hot Middle Eastern sun. If he did want to be there, I don't know what that says about him as a person. We really don't know anything about this centurion at all. But there's a very strong possibility, since he's the guy at the foot of the cross, that he was probably one of the people that nailed Jesus to the cross, physically put him there. And as he watches Jesus die, he says something really amazing. He says, truly this man was the Son of God. That's how the Gospel of Mark start, starts off. The Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And after chapter 1, verse 1, not a single person in the entire Gospel of Mark ever calls Jesus Son of God. Not one. Until this guy. Until this centurion. He's the one who gives the faithful confession of faith. He's the one that says the words that the Gospel of Mark has been driving to since the very first verse. Truly this man was the Son of God. When he hears the words that Jesus spoke from the cross, when he sees Jesus die for the sin of the entire world, when he encounters Jesus on Good Friday, God grants him faith. And God grants him this, this amazing confession of faith that nobody else could make. That's what an encounter with Jesus does for us, too. When we hear Jesus' words spoken to us, when we see him dying for the sin of the entire world and for our sin individually and specifically, God grants us faith. God grants us the words to say, the confession of faith that comes from our heart and over our lips. And when we hear it again and again and again, God strengthens his faith through his word. He reminds us of his great love. He reminds us of the blood that flowed for you and the body that was broken for you and the Son of God who died for you. That's why we got a long gospel reading this week. That's why we read 47 verses out of the gospel, because encountering Jesus means receiving forgiveness. Encountering Jesus means getting that gospel deeper into your heart. Encountering Jesus means fostering faith. And so I'll close with this this morning. It's an encouragement and really a challenge. The challenge is encounter Jesus this week. Encounter Jesus in your home. This chapter of Mark, it's a long one to read in church, but it actually only takes a few minutes to read. And so read it. Read it every day, this Holy Week. Between now and Easter Sunday, read it every single day, Mark 15. And even better, add Mark 14 to it. It's not that much more. And it tells you the whole story. Get it into your heart and get it into your mind the sacrifice of Jesus. Because see, that's where the Holy Spirit works when we encounter Jesus in his word. And don't leave it at that. Don't just encounter Jesus in your home. Encounter him in your church too. This is the most amazing week of worship in the entire life of the church. It's a great week and it's got some really unique worship experiences. So come back to your church. Come back here on Monday, Thursday. Receive the body and blood of Jesus. Watch us strip the altar. Hear the words of Psalm 22. Come back on Good Friday. Reflect in the darkness with your brothers and sisters in Christ on the words that Jesus spoke on the cross for you. Come back on Holy Saturday. Reflect on the word of God. Reflect on your baptism in preparation for Easter. And most especially, come back on Easter Sunday. Relive the resurrection with us. And look forward to your own resurrection too. Encounter Jesus this week.
And as you encounter Jesus this week, as you read, as you reflect, and as you worship, keep those two words in your mind the whole time. For you. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds, keeping them steadfast in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, we continue our worship with our uh, tithes and offerings and invite all the children forward for the children's message. And if you guys can bring your palms with you, we're going to talk about palms. Yes. Oh, yeah, don't put those in there. Guys, you can hold on to those. There you go. There you go, Isaac. I've got one for you. There you go. I brought some extras. Okay, guys, so you know why we're doing palms today, right? Because today is what? Palm Sunday, right. And so we didn't get to talk about the story of Palm Sunday in, in uh, the gospel reading. So I'm going to tell it to you guys, and I'm going to use this book. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to take a look at the pictures. And a lot of you guys can tell me the story, so I want your help, okay? Uh, this is Jesus going into Jerusalem. So you see these guys. What are they doing? Yeah, exactly. They're walking. And they're walking because what they did was once a year— they would all go to Jerusalem, and they'd go with their families, and usually that meant not just mom and dad, but also their cousins and their brothers and their sisters. Some of you guys have a lot of cousins and brothers and sisters right here in the congregation, right? So can you imagine taking a whole big group of people every single year and walking miles and miles to go to like a probably three or four day uh, sort of camping trip or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You'd, you'd get in pretty good shape pretty quick. Well, they're doing it, but one year, especially what ha- one year in particular, what happens is that this guy is there in Jerusalem. And you know who this guy is, right? Jesus. Yeah, right. Jesus is there in Jerusalem. And you see him pointing to these guys? They're asking about, how are we going to go into Jerusalem, Jesus? And what Jesus says is, go in, and you're going to find a horse and a donkey tied up, untie him, and bring him to me. <laughs> exactly. Right. So uh, check out this guy here. What's he saying, do you think? Exactly, exactly. Imagine if you went out into your driveway and somebody was getting into your parents' car and driving off. What do you think they would do? They'd probably go, uh, they might probably call the police is what would happen, right? But they'd go, why are you taking my car? And this guy's like, why are you taking my donkey and my horse? But they say, Hank, you said it. What do they say? Exactly. Jesus needs it. And now you can see the guy is what? Yeah, he's going, okay, okay, go ahead and take him, right? And so Jesus uses those things. And you guys know this part of the story, right? They've got the things that you guys have. What do you have? Palm branches. Yeah, you've got palm branches. And what do they say? Palm branches. That's right. Do you guys remember what that means? Close. Oh, very good. It means help us, please, or save us, please. That's very good. And the way that he's going to do that, because I bet this is what Jesus was thinking about as he's riding into Jerusalem. What's he thinking about here? Yeah, he's thinking about the cross. Exactly. He's thinking about how he's going to save us. None of these people realize that how he's going to save us is by dying on the cross for us. For our sins. sins. You're right. Exactly. And they were very tired. (laughs) Right. And so as he's doing this, as he's looking at these kids, they're not just kids, they're not just friends, they're not just people who are worshiping him, they're people that he's going to die for, right? Just like you and just like me. Can I pray with you guys? Let's pray. Can you fold your hands and bow your heads, and I'll say some words and you send back to Jesus. Dear God, thank you for today. Hosanna, God. Please save us. Thank you for sending Jesus. 
to die for our sins. Amen. Okay, last thing, guys. Uh, some of you guys are in faith families, and I did something I really enjoyed in faith families this week, and I haven't done for a long time. I colored. You guys like to color? Yeah, I like to color too, and I got to do it in faith families. My favorite thing to color with is crayons. Markers look cool and stuff, but I really like crayons. So I brought you guys a coloring sheet. I thought you, might, you guys like, you know, might enjoy coloring as much as I do. Take one with you as you go. This is a Palm Sunday coloring sheet. And by the way, if you like this book and you like books like this, there's a whole bunch of arch books back there that you can have for free that you can take with you. And it's about all the stuff that we're doing this week. Thanks for coming up, you guys. Oh, Isaac, did I miss you? <laughs> nice. Palm Shoe Day. Absolutely. Oh, Maylene, that's so cool. Other people were making palm jewelry in the last service, and that's awesome. You guys need a hand? Oh. For giving us everything that we need for this body and life and, and uh, that everything you did for us through your death and resurrection um, was just that, what was for us. And so we respond uh, to your, your generosity, your pouring out of your very life uh, by giving, uh, giving you a, a portion of that which you have uh, given to us. Uh, we have to ask that you may use these, our tithes and our offerings, uh, that more people may know uh, that what Jesus has done is for them. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Uh, a couple updates uh, to the prayer page uh, listed in your bulletin. Uh, the first uh, is for Brian Fryer. Uh, Brian is having surgery uh, on Thursday morning, so we'll keep him in our prayers this week. Uh, for the family and friends of Jay Rodehorst, uh, Jay is a friend of the Frankfurt family, and he uh, died on March 18th. So keep his uh, family and friends in our prayers. Uh, and then uh, an update on Henry Cruz. Henry is the father of Ken Cruz. Uh, we've been praying for him for a while, uh, and Henry is, uh, is back home on hospice care. Uh, and so we'll keep uh, him and his family in our prayers. As you're able, please rise. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, your Son humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. So fix our faith upon his death for our salvation. Enrich the proclamation of the gospel and enliven our hearts to live out this faith until Christ comes again in glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uphold this, wor this world in your order. Preserve the church and the preaching of your word against all enemies. Bless our homes, that parents and children may serve one another faithfully and grow in instruction and faith until life's end. And especially this week, we lift up these families of our congregation. For Brett Balsters, Ken and Sandra Balsters, Matthew Bandy, Charlene Bandy, Jimmy Bauer, Dottie Bauer, Ron and Cheryl Bedner, Jack and Pat Benefell, John and Christine Bertels, and Tim and Heidi Bertels. Give health and wisdom to all who serve in public office, that their authority may be exercised for the benefit of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God Almighty, our Lord Jesus did not count his equality with you something to be grasped, but humbled himself. Grant us a mind like his to spurn all worldly equality and humbling ourselves to find your greater portion in the life of the world to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, your Son came to deliver his people from all evil. Take away the fear of all who suffer in this world. 
especially this week, we lift up Brian Fryer, Leroy Braking, Cheryl Krause, Alice Gunderson, Laverne Goosewell, Luke Onken, Charlene Halemeyer, Lucy Hale, Renee Valerie, Becky Bodenstab, Eunice Weber, Filmer and Anime Shane Baum, Fred Dorr, Pat Benefil, Becky and George Smith, Carol Booz, Joy Lotz, Danny Wiesman, the family and friends of Jay Rodehorst, Randy Lambert, Alex Bradshaw, Abram Smith, Pam Wiggins, Evelyn Shoppett, Daryl Johnson, Bob DeWerf, Dave Robertson, Kimberly Hanks, Al Bolin, Larry Lovejoy, Henry Cruz, Gary McDonough, Dan Cruz, Carla Klaustermeyer, Carolyn Wells, Veronica Armentrout, Bob Huff, Jim Hubner, Jeff Frome, Richard Dupotz, Carl Monaco, Robert Rombach, Dale Jones, Don Goble, Paul Knobloch, Missy Wiesman, Jennifer Withrow, Sheila Williams, Dan Shane here, and all those we need before you in our hearts. As they await the fullness of their salvation, fix their eyes upon their crucified Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal Lord, as your Son once entered humbly into Jerusalem to cries of Hosanna, so send him to us according to his promise in the Holy Sacrament, that we may eat his body and drink his blood in repentance and faith for the forgiveness of our sins and in the unity of a true confession. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We praise you, Father, that you have sent your Son not in wrath, but in mercy. As we enter this most holy week and ponder together the mysteries of your great salvation, show us the answer to your people's prayers of Hosanna and the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord invites us uh, to encounter him uh, as he is truly present uh, through his body and blood in, with, and under uh, the bread and the wine in this meal. Uh, we also believe that, that uh, as we gather together for communion, uh, we gather together uh, expressing a unity in our common confession of faith. And So if you're uh, joining us and, and you haven't yet been instructed or uh, in, in our confession of faith as Lutheran Church, Missouri Center of Lutherans, uh, we still invite you to come forward, uh, cross your arms to receive a blessing, and we'd love to talk to you more afterwards about who we are and what we believe. Our oh Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, just one note on uh, how we uh, do communion distribution at this service. We uh, will begin with a praise band, and then the ushers will dismiss uh, each section to come forward. Um, and if, if uh, you're wanting to receive communion uh, in the pews, just let one of the ushers know, and we will uh, come bring communion out to you at the end. God's blessings to you during this time of worship.
Please rise. We pray. God, we give thanks that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we depart, we depart with the blessing and the promise of our God to be with you wherever you go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give to you his peace. Amen. Sing and honor, glory and power, be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your
blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. If you would uh, be seated for just a second, thanks again for coming out to Zion this morning. It's a blessing to be together on this Palm Sunday celebration. Uh, there's a lot more this week, of course, at Zion. So um, the services uh, times are all here on the back of your bulletin. Uh, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil. Remember, the Easter Vigil service is not an Easter service. It happens during the normal Saturday night service time, but it's not the same as Sunday morning. Uh, so come back for that. Come back for those services. Join us for, for it's an amazing week of worship in the church. Um, also this week, and it sounds like we, we didn't exactly know the time when the Hope Center would be ready, but uh, it looks like the time is tomorrow. People are going over to paint uh, at the Hope Center. They needed some help. If you don't know what the Hope Center is, it's a really great thing that uh, meets the needs of people in our community. Um, and uh, we're, there's a bunch of people going out to paint at the Hope Center tomorrow. If you're interested in that, uh, there's a sign-up sheet uh, back there uh, in the Ministry Center. You can put your name and your phone number down, and uh, Steve Teak will get in contact with you um, about time and stuff like that. If you can make it great, uh, we'd love to have the help. Um, <clears throat> oh, uh, no pericopes class this week also uh, with Holy Week and, and everything that's going on. We won't do our Tuesday morning Bible study this week. Uh, then after Easter, April 6th is the school auction. Uh, so there's more information in your bulletin. You can get tickets uh, in the ministry center uh, between services. So you can, uh, uh, you can get them here. You can get them in the church office. Um, come and join us for that. Uh, this Friday, and, and again, there's details on this in your bulletin, but crosswalk is happening. It's something we do um, Good Friday most years, I think. And we walk from the senior center here in Bethalto at 11 o'clock back here carrying the cross that goes out front. Uh, so come join us for that as well. Again, more details in your bulletin on that. And then uh, last but not least, please do this favor for me. Mark your calendar for uh, 
May 9th. That's a Thursday evening, and it's Ascension service. It's 7 o'clock. It's here at Zion. It's a service that we do jointly with Wood River. Why am I telling you this a month and a half early? Because Pastor Schultz, at the last Lenten breakfast, or the second last Lenten breakfast, the one that he did, uh, he told the people at the Lenten breakfast that he thought Wood River could get more people at that Ascension service than we could in our own house. We have home field advantage here, guys. And there was some mention of uh, a friendly, I guess, wager where the losing pastor would wear the opposing church's t-shirt for a post on social media or something like that. And guys, I hate to lose. (laughs) So do it for me. Ascension service here at Zion. Let's show those Wood River people. God's blessings on your week.